Good morning, church family. Good to see all of you. Uh, so glad to be here this morning. We're continuing our sermon series called Prophetic Vision, Seeing the World Through God's Eyes. And I want to thank Gene Frost for a, a great sermon uh, last week. Uh, as a church, I said we're in a season of discerning vision uh, of where God might be leading us and taking us over the next several years. And I mentioned the importance of being aligned to God's vision because if we aren't, disastrous results. I'll give you another, another example. Uh, when Laura and I were first married, our biggest conflict was over differing visions of what a clean house meant. And I remember what, one night, Laura was going out to, going out to work, I think, and, and she said, Honey, can you clean the house while I'm... Well, as a new husband, I was very eager uh, to, to help my wife. Genuinely very eager. I said, Of course, be glad to do that. So she, she goes off. I clean the house. I go through the whole, the whole house, put everything away, clean everything. I sit back down. I think I did some reading. She comes back. So it was to my great shock that she says to me, I thought I asked you to clean the house. I look around, I said, I did clean the house. <laughs> then she proceeded to take me around the house and said, well, your, your, your jacket's not put away. There, oh, there's a pair of socks underneath the couch I see. You have some papers you left out on the counter. Oh, the dishes are drying in the strainer. They're not put away in the cupboard. And I realized, that well, actually, the house does look like a mess. But to me, for a person who had recently moved out of a college guy's dorm... The house was extremely clean to me. The problem was our visions of what a clean house meant did not match. And I would suggest to you that, that uh, even though I was, I was good at heart, I was well-intentioned, that it did not line up. And this same dynamic happens between us and God. God has a vision for our lives. God has a vision for what it means to follow Christ and to be the church and sometimes I wonder if our vision doesn't match his. What, what is your vision of the good Christian life? What is your vision of a good Christian, someone that follows Jesus? What does that mean to you? What does that look like? And, it, and I wonder, is it really aligned with what God envisioned for us? So you see, in Isaiah's day, the people's vision of the spiritual life did not match God's. Um, and I'd love for you to follow along with me this morning. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 58, uh, if you want to open up your Bibles to that chapter. Uh, now, Isaiah w was speaking to a people who were very spiritual. They were well-intentioned. They were eager, it says, uh, to follow God, but they were totally off in the, uh, their vision of the kind of spiritual life that pleases God. And so God gives Isaiah a task, and he says this. This is verse 1. Shout it aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. How many people would like that ministry assignment? I want you to go shout it. I want you to go declare. I want you to publicly get in their face and tell them their sins. Why? What was their sin? Well, we go to verse 2. Well, for day after day they seek me out, they seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Wow, what's so wrong with this people? This sounds like a Christian nation, I mean, a holy nation. Day after day they seek God, they're eager to know His ways. They like to learn what God's Word says. They're praying for justice and righteousness. They, they want God to come near them. They love to worship. They love to pray. They, they love being at the temple near God. They love the festivals. They love the sacrifices. They love all of the spiritual practices. It says they, they even fast and they remember the Sabbath. They're very spiritual. So what's the problem? The problem is their vision of the spiritual life did not match God's. Or at least it was very incomplete. And I would submit to you there are at least three visions of the spiritual life contained within this chapter. Uh, we'll discuss the first two, which fall short uh, of God's vision for us. And we'll discuss the third, which is aligned uh, with God's vision. The first type of spirituality uh, contained in this text is, number one, uh, superstitious spirituality. Superstitious spirituality. This is practices spirituality in order to get something from God. If I do this practice, then God will do this, then this will happen. 
The vision is that God is kind of some spiritual genie, uh, that spiritual practices can earn some type of favor or merit from God. Um, And this is clearly an aspect of what's going on uh, in Isaiah's day. Because if you jump down to verse 3, they say, well, why have we fasted, they say, and have you not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and have you not noticed? See, they were fasting, they were doing this spiritual practice in order to get God to do something. I think we can often fall into this trap ourselves. We think if we, if we pray enough, if we fast enough, if we give enough, if we're, if we're going to church, then, then God will repay us somehow uh, with blessings or that paycheck or the thing that you've been wanting. Uh, and so we're shocked then when something bad happens to us, although we've been very spiritual. Uh, the sociologists Christian Smith and Melinda Denton, they published a book in 2005. Uh, it was called Soul Searching, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers. Now, those teenagers are now the millennials uh, of my generation, so the people raising young kids today. Uh, And so these sociologists, they discovered that there was a commonly held set of religious beliefs for American teenagers at this time, and I think this is still generally true. Uh, Essentially, people believe that God created the world, uh, that he wants people generally to to be good people and to be happy. He doesn't really have to be a big part of your life, uh, but he's there when you need him. If you have a problem, you can talk to him. You can, God will help you, you know, feel better about your life. You know, it's kind of like God is some divine butler or maybe kind of a, they say, say he's a cosmic therapist up there in the sky. You can reach out for him when you need him, when you need help. You see, superstitious spirituality it wants God to solve our problems. It views spiritual practices like putting quarters into a candy machine. Remember those candy machines when you were a kid? You put the 25 cents in, you get, out, you get something out. I think people view spirituality like that. If I put this in, if I do this, then this is going to come out and I'll enjoy it. But the problem is, God's not like that. God is not a candy machine. God is not a butler. He's not Santa. He's not your therapist. God is God. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And he rules this world in ways that we cannot even begin to fathom. And if we view the spiritual life superstitiously, We're surely in for disappointment and a bankrupt spirituality that despite all of the spiritual practices, that it actually displeases God. Why? Because I don't think anybody wants to be in a relationship where you're just trying to get something from them. If someone is just trying to get something from you, that doesn't feel good, does it? That's a transaction. That's a commodity. But often we can fall into the trap of trying to do that with God. The second type of spirituality contained in this text is what I'm calling self-focused spirituality. Uh, This is someone who practices spirituality without reference to others or to the world around them. Uh, The good spiritual life is a close personal relationship with God through spiritual practices. And we develop ourselves, we grow through individual spiritual practices. I think most Christians today probably fall into this category. Uh, though we wouldn't readily admit our focus is on ourselves, but we're, we're well-intentioned. Uh, we're like that eager new husband wanting to please the spouse, uh, but our vision's off. Because the vision, the vision of the, uh, most people's vision of the good spiritual life is a good personal relationship with God. Now that's great, but the vision doesn't include other people or all of God's creation. It's primarily self-focused. And I, I have to confess to you that this has been my formation for pretty much all my Christian life. And I bet if you ask yourself, you might, you might find yourself in the same boat. Because what, what's your vision of the good Christian life? What's your vision of a good Christian? I think for, for most evangelicals, it's getting into the Word, spending quiet time with God, and attending church regularly. If you're doing those three things, you're doing great. That's a, great, that's a great Christian for most people. Those are all important, incredibly important. Uh, and then what do we do? You know, when it's, when it's really time, when, I, when I'm really ready to get serious, say, I want to I I repent, I want to get back to God, maybe it's the new year, uh, maybe it's Lent, what do we do? We add more spiritual practices, don't we? I'm going to pray more now, I'm going to get in the Bible more, I'm going I'm to finally do the Bible reading plan this year, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to journal, I'm going to go to some extra services. We multiply spiritual practices. Why? Because that's our vision of the spiritual life. That's our vision of the good Christian life. Now, if you know me, if you've heard my preaching for the last six years, you know I really believe in the importance of spiritual practices. 
I think that's, I think that's, I'm not, I'm not saying that. My Bible reading plan, it keeps me in God's word. I mean, without prayer, we are dead spiritually. Jesus taught us to abide in him. There's a reason our evangelical forefathers and foremothers, they said, and they kept hammering it home, be in your Bible, be in prayer. There is a reason for that. But may I be so bold to say that this vision is really incomplete. It really falls short of God's vision of a good spiritual life. It's missing maybe even the main point. It's missing loving people, meeting needs, serving the poor, charity, love, justice, compassion, mercy. You know, I think it's interesting, you know, the, the, the saints of the Old Testament, they knew the Shema that they said, you know, usually several times a day. The great commandment, you all know what it is, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus, he's asked about this. Teacher, what do you think the great commandment is? So he says the Shema but then he did something radical that no one had ever put together. He quotes Leviticus. So it was in the tradition, but it wasn't connected. And he said, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. I think Jesus recognized even then, we think it's about me loving God. It's about me and God. But he said, no, no, no. You can never think about loving God without thinking about loving other people. Those should never, ever be divorced in our vision of a good spiritual life. The people of Isaiah's day, they were eager to know God. They fasted. They learned his word. They loved worship. But then it says, yet on your day of fasting, you do as you please. I think that reveals their spirituality was really uh, about themselves. Because still at the core, they were living to please themselves. Uh, Verse 3 says, you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. Not only are they pleasing themselves, they're also hurting other people through oppression. Now, it sounds like what happened is they maybe they wanted to seek God. Uh, you know, Dan mentioned that they're they in the exile. They want, they want God to restore the land. So they call a fast day to repent. But what they don't do is they don't give their workers the day off. You have to fast. You have to go without food, but we're not giving you the day off. And I can imagine for myself, if I had to work all day in the hot, hot fields, if you've ever been there, the hot fields of Israel, I think I'd get pretty hangry myself. I mean, no wonder it says they were quarreling and at strife. We have to go without food and still eat. Doesn't that sound a lot like Pharaoh? You have to make the breaks, but I'm not giving you the straw. I mean, this is oppression. The dollar meant more to people than actually seeking God. And they did the same thing with the Sabbath. If you jump down to verse 13, God says, if you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day. So they knew about the Sabbath. They might remember the Sabbath, but they didn't take the day off. They didn't take the day off work. They didn't want want to lose a day of income. Money was, again, more important than pleasing God. Jesus was right. You can't serve God and money. They come into conflict time and time again. The people were not trusting that God would provide for them, so they kept working their people on the Sabbath and on their fast days. And the people's actions revealed that despite all of their spirituality, they really cared mostly about themselves. On your fasting days and on the, on the Sabbath, you do as you please. I think sometimes this is true with us. You might start the morning in prayer and with devotions, but then you live your day generally as you please. You may read God's word, but then go out and live as you please. Sometimes, I, I think too, even our spiritual disciplines, if we're honest, it's about pleasing ourselves. You know, we're, we're, we live in a very academic culture. We, we love to learn. We love to learn. I think we're guilty of loving knowledge acquisition more than actually loving God and loving people. We love to learn new things. We love to parse the Greek. We love to hear something new. And then if it's not, if it's not something new, we, we get bored and we give up. And then this show is that we were ultimately in it for our own enjoyment anyway. If it's not entertaining us, if it's not pleasing us, we might abandon the practice altogether. Friends, it's not about knowledge acquisition, but Christ's loving action. It's not about self-development, but it's about self-denial. It's not about self-actualization, but self-sacrifice. It's not about self-improvement, but it's about others' improvement. It's not about your personal goals, but it's about interpersonal connection and love. It's not just me and God, my relationship with God. It's God, me, others, the poor, all of God's creation. 
That's our vision of, the, of the spiritual life. And that leads me to our final type of spirituality, which I am calling shalom restoring spirituality. Shalom is that great uh, Hebrew word. It's often translated peace, but it's, it, it means way more than that. Shalom is when everything is as God intended, God, humanity, all of creation, living in perfect harmony and peace with God. Things as God intended them to be. That's shalom. Superstitious spirituality tries to get something from God. Self-focused spirituality tries to improve my personal relationship with God. But shalom-restoring spirituality is primarily concerned with restoring shalom to others in the world around them. Shalom-restoring spirituality practices spirituality in order to become the type of person that practically loves God and loves people. The vision is God's restoring all creation in Christ. God is restoring all things in Christ Jesus. Therefore, the spiritual life is about participating in restoring all of creation. Therefore, spiritual practices are a means to help us live out this vision. Notice it's not no spirituality. Spirituality is needed, but it must serve the vision of where God is taking the world. We need spirituality. We desperately need practices that form us into this type of people because if we don't, we're going to be formed by the world. We're going to be formed by the culture around us. We need spirituality. But whatever spirituality we have, it ought to serve this vision. So done rightly, worship, fasting, Sabbath, prayer, Bible reading, and so on, they ought to transform us and lead us into becoming the type of people who work towards God's shalom. Isaiah says, jumping down to verse 6 and 7, Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke? To set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and to not turn away from your own flesh and blood? This is God's vision of the spiritual life. Getting rid of the chains that keep people in unjust situations setting the oppressed free from all who and from all that oppresses them, sharing food with the hungry, providing the poor wanderer, the immigrant, the refugee with shelter. That's God's vision of a spirituality that pleases Him. Does your vision match God's? Does your vision match God's? In fact, I think this really reminds me of Jesus. This was Jesus' vision too. Doesn't this remind you of Matthew 25? I think I have this on the screen. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Does your vision of the spiritual life match Jesus Christ? I think the greatest missing ingredient ingredient to our spiritual formation as individuals and as a church is good works done for those in need, especially done for those in need. You know, Protestants get very nervous about good works because uh, we learn that we are liberated from earning our salvation. Praise be to God. Uh, we, We abandon that mentality, but in the process, we often abandon the good works themselves, which were really the central point of our deliberation. Uh, in our salvation. And I, I don't believe I'm, I'm overstating the case there. And since we're evangelical, since we're Bible people, can we do some Bible study? You guys want to do some Bible study with me? Let's, let's talk about this. Good works. Jesus saved us for good works. Titus 2.14. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. Zealous, passionate, eager. God has prepared good works for us to do, Ephesians 2.10. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. Our faith without works is dead. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Surely that faith cannot save, can it? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. 
Good deeds are how we show other people true love. How does God abide in anyone who has the world's uh, goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but with deed, in deed and truth. Good works are key to spreading the gospel. We want to do that, don't we? Jesus said, in the same way, let your light shine before others. They may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And finally, the church is called to provoke each other to this. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Church ought to be like the halftime of, of a sports game. You're coming in here. Okay, guys, well, yeah, that, that was a hard first half. Let's, let's, let's get let's get. Let's get our energy. We got to get back out there and continue the good work that God has called us to do. That's why I tell you every week, go be the church and make disciples because we're sending you back out. We want to provoke you. We want to encourage you to be about Jesus' work in the world because that's what we're called to do. Encourage you to live a life of restoring shalom. Can you see the centrality of good works in the vision of the New Testament? Does not the Bible itself teach us that this is the centerpiece of what it means? I think one of the most spiritual things you can do is just simply serve others in need. Simply serve others. And I, it's, this is just my personal opinion, but I, I tend to think that the greatest spiritual lives are those that are rich in good works over the lifetime, over the lifetime. Because uh, what I've found, what I've seen, what I've experienced is, experienced is you cannot keep up a life of good works unless you are a very spiritual, abiding person in Christ. Because you will not have the power. You will not have the resources. You will get burnt out. You'll, get, you'll give it up. You'll abandon it. The, most spirit, the, most, the people who serve the most tend to have the deepest spiritual lives because they need God to energize them for the work that they've committed themselves to doing. Does that make sense? That's what Jesus did. It says he was, all, he was often up early, alone with the Father. But then how did he spend his day? He went about doing good, the Bible says. Serving those in need, delivering people, healing them, helping them. That's what Jesus did. This is God's vision of a spiritual life that pleases him. Does your vision match? Does it match? This is the kind of Bible reading God would choose. This is the kind of prayer life God would choose, one that leads us into a shalom-restoring spirituality, one that takes care of others, that delivers them from oppression and injustice, one that takes care of the poor and one's neighbor. But you say, you know, Nate, this, this is great, but this, this sounds really tiring. I've got enough going on in my life already, uh, and this is a lot more work than just reading my Bible. But oh, dear friend, <laughs> would you read the Bible with me again? What, is, what, is it, what does God say? What does God promise us? Verse, verse 8 in Isaiah. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, here I am. Jumping down to verse 10, if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and you satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and he will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Friends, a life filled with good works is a life-giving life. It's a life-giving life. It's a life blessed by God. I mean, look at these promises. God promises if you spend your life this way, He will be responsive to your prayers. He will bring healing. He will guide you. He will satisfy your needs. When you're tired, it says He will strengthen you. How can we not have time to do that that which is of utmost importance, which is central to our salvation, which does the most good in the world and will prove to be life-giving for ourselves. How could we not have the time for that? The founding father, Ben Franklin, not the Ben Franklin who attends and is a member here, the other Ben Franklin that you know about, he started each day by asking himself, what good shall I do today? And he'd plan it, he'd think about it, and he'd go do it. And then at the end of the day, he would ask himself, what good have I done today? 
That's how he bookended his day. And I think that's a good practical model for us as believers, who are the ones who should be the most eager to do what is good in the world as we work to restore God's shalom. And it's also a good reminder that we simply do this one day at a time. We're not going to save the world. We're not going to rid the world of injustice. I mean, that'd be great if we could, but we're not going to do it in, uh, in one day. We just, we just have one day at a time. Lord, what good can I do today for others? Let the Holy Spirit bring ideas to your mind and then go do it. And then check in with yourself at the end of the day. What good did I do today? Thank God that you had the privilege of doing good for somebody else because that's what he saved us to go do. And I want to ask you too, how would the witness of the church in the world, how, how, how would the witness of Christians change in the world if we were known primarily, primarily as people who were doing good in the community? Would that not change our witness from what people generally think of when they think of Christians and they think of the church? I mean, what if people in the community said, we can't live without the churches? We can't live without Faith Covenant Church because they're doing so much good for the people in our community. If the church is known for anything, we should be known for our good deeds done in Jesus' name, not for all the junk you read about in the news. So let's be good news to people through our good deeds so that people will give us a hearing to share the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do. Would you pray with me that God would help us make this a reality in our lives and as a church?